Are you all seeing my uh, cover slide? Is it American flag? Yes. Good. Yes. Good. Great. So um, over the last uh, 20 years or more, my entire time uh, here at Middlebury, the focus of my writing has been the relationship between Christian faith and American public life, kind of broadly construed. What does it mean to be a Christian in um, public life in the U.S., politically, socially, culturally, uh, what have you? Um, I'm interested in that historically. Uh, and as we, some of us talked uh, this morning, uh, I consider myself an historian of American um, uh, church history, uh, and I'm often reaching back into some of that historical material for some wisdom uh, to answer that question. How do we navigate these two identities, faith identity and also public or political identity? Ultra ultimately, though, I'm interested in the questions that are raised for our negotiation of those two identities in our time and place. What does it mean to be a Christian and an American today? How do those two identities relate to one another? How do they shape one another? Are they always compatible? Are they sometimes in tension with one another? How should we Christians understand our identity as American citizens and our collective identity uh, as a nation? So these are the questions I've been interested in for a very long time. And I consider these questions to be both theological and ethical or moral uh, questions. And to give you a sense of what I mean by that, I offered um, a definition of, of ethics um, that I offer my students every uh, the beginning of every uh, ethics class. I consider ethics to be the study of the values that govern what we ought to do or not do and the people that we ought to be or become as individuals and as uh, societies. That to me is what ethics means. And so Christian ethics is exploring the values of Christian faith that ought to govern our actions and our character in all of the uh, arenas of life, including uh, our political life. And so uh, Christianity is a theological tradition, but it's also a moral tradition and an ethical tradition. And it has a lot to say about these questions of public identity, public obligation, um, public service. Uh, who ought we to be as American Christians and what ought we to do or not do? Our Christian tradition has a lot uh, to say about that. Uh, I am a theological ethicist, um, but as I say, I'm also an historian of early American religion. And I, I think that history ought to inform our address of these questions. So that's what I'd like to do tonight. And again, uh, tomorrow morning, think about these um, ultimately ethical questions about our dual identity as American Christians and to do that both historically and theologically. And we'll do more historical tonight and we'll do more um, a, a better balance of historical and theological uh, tomorrow morning. Now, one reason why these questions are, um, I think, so urgent for us in our time and place is that there is prevalent in American culture right now, a particular answer to that question. What does it mean to be an American Christian? How do we understand the relationship between Christian faith and American identity? There is a very uh, powerful proposal in our American um, uh, politics at this moment, and that is Christian nationalism. I understand Christian nationalism as being an answer to that question. What does it mean to be both of these things? What does it mean to think about the United States through a faith lens and also through um, a, a political lens? Christian nationalism has, of course, been in the news a lot lately, especially in the last um, year or more. Uh, and it will be my conversation partner um, both tonight and tomorrow, but especially tonight. I want us to think carefully about what Christian nationalism is, um, who it is, um, how people who profess to be Christian nationalists understand the answer to our question. Uh, and I want to think about um, connections between what this movement believes and maybe some things that some of us uh, uh, believe, uh, even if we don't consider ourselves uh, a Christian nationalist. I want to think about how much of Christian nationalist worldview is based on a particular understanding of Christian theology and of history and how that interpretation is, in my view, wrong, incorrect, uh, that they uh, represent neither American history 
nor Christian tradition accurately. I will also want to think about, um, is there a degree to which they do have uh, some things right? Uh, and uh, is there a way in which the critique of Christian nationalism also uh, gets some of our history uh, and theology wrong? Um, but if the thesis here is that Christian nationalism is wrong, uh, and I do believe that, that it's not only wrong, but dangerous, uh, I think engaging it is going to help set us up to think more constructively and theologically tomorrow about what might be a right way uh, to think about the relationship between faith and national identity, and again, to use history to do that. So what is Christian nationalism? Let's go ahead and start with that. It can be difficult to answer this question, what is Christian nationalism, because it's all over the media, uh, and the media um, rarely defines what they mean by that. Uh, and so in some portrayals of Christian nationalism in the media, you would swear that to be a Christian nationalist means that you think your faith convictions are relevant to public life and politics. But if that's all that Christian nationalism means, then I'm a Christian nationalist uh, because I think there is a relevance between the, the values I get from my faith and my participation in public life and how I think about what is good and right uh, in American society. So hopefully Christian nationalism means something more than that, um, something more specific than that. And I wanna suggest um, uh, uh, a more precise way to under Christ understand Christian nationalism. Uh, if, and I've given you a definition on uh, this slide. Christian nationalism to me is the militant belief that the US was and is a Christian nation ordained by God to protect and propagate Christian ideals, that real Americans are Christian and real Christians are patriotic, and that resistance to pluralism and secularism is a religious and patriotic duty. So there are a couple of things very quickly that I just want to lift up out of this definition that are to me at least important. One is uh, that Christian nationalism is is a militant uh, movement in the sense that um, it, it, it's not enough to say that Christian nationalists believe that faith should play a, a, a deep role in American public life, but the way that they go about that um, is, uh, is especially militant um, and especially uh, kind of binary, either or. The second thing I wanna uh, raise about this de definition is that Christian uh, nationalism collapse the identity of religious and political identity. Um, so to be a Christian is to be an American, to be an American is to be Christian uh, from a nationalistic uh, point of view. And the third thing I would point out is that hostility to pluralism uh, at the end. Um, that what dis dis one of the things that distinguishes Christian nationalism is that it sees pluralism as a threat to both faith and uh, public good and that it needs to be stamped out uh, either legally or a more coercive measure uh, by more coercive measures. So this is uh, my working definition of Christian uh, nationalism. Measuring uh, um, Christian nationalism, just how prevalent is this movement in the United States is something that a number of uh, political scientists have undertaken in the last couple of years. This is not work that I do, so I find myself indebted to them to answer the question, just how many Americans do subscribe to this uh, particular ideology? Um, one of the really fine books that I have stumbled on in the last uh, year is this one uh, called Taking America Back for God, Christian Nationalism in the United States by Andrew Whitehead and Samuel Perry. Um, I find this to be a really readable book. So if you're interested in um, Christian nationalism and its presence in the United States, you might wanna pick this, uh, this book up. But Whitehead and Perry are arguing, uh, they're going about trying to, trying to figure out just how many Americans subscribe to this uh, movement. And they want to be clear as they go uh, uh, to measure it, that they consider Christian nationalism not just a subset of Christian beliefs. In fact, they argue it's principally not about religion at all. They say it is a, uh, it, it's a constellation, a, what they call a cultural framework 
a collection of myths, traditions, symbols, narratives, and value systems that idealizes and advocates a fusion of Christianity with American civic life. That, those are their words. Ultimately, what they're arguing is, what they're trying to measure is not religion. It's not a particular uh, version of Christianity. That Christian nationalism is a perception of political power. Who should have it? Who is a threat to it? Um, why they should have it or not have it? Um, it's a perception of political power baptized by Christian theology and endorsed by a particular reading of history. So they go uh, about trying to measure just how many, if my definition of Christian nationalism is a decent uh, definition of this movement, just how many Americans um, subscribe to this. And they did so by asking uh, a series of questions on a survey um, and measuring, inviting people to respond to those questions with you know, what you would uh, imagine a survey would do, strongly agree, agree, kind of agree, uh, very much, uh, kind of disagree, very much disagree, that kind of thing, that kind of spectrum. Um, and the survey consisted of six questions. Um, and the questions were, um, do you agree or disagree with the following statements? Uh, the federal government should declare the US a Christian nation. The federal government should advocate Christian values. The federal government should enforce strict separation of church and state. The federal government should allow public display of religious symbols, so religious uh, symbols on public property. The federal government should allow prayer in public schools. And finally, the success of the US is part of God's plan. So these are the six statements they invited people to agree, strongly agree, disagree, strongly degree, disagree with. And based on um, respondents' answers to those reflect, uh, responses to those statements, um, they, um, they categorized um, the respondents uh, in, in um, degrees of relationship with Christian nationalism. And they came up with four types of Americans. And these are the four types. The rejectors are people who strongly disagreed with most, if not all, of these statements. Um, and, and by doing so, clearly signaled their rejection of the idea that the United States has an explicitly Christian heritage that it should defend, uh, protect, and, and own. Resistors were like a weak version of that. Um, folks that, that disagreed with most of those statements, but perhaps not as strongly as the rejectors. Accommodators, well, let's go to ambassadors first. At the other end of the spectrum are ambassadors of Christian nationalism. These are people who agree with all of those statements that the federal government should declare the United States a Christian nation, should actively defend Christian values, um, should allow prayer in public schools, et cetera. And the accommodators were people who more softly endorsed, less enthusiastically endorsed um, those ideas. So they learned a couple of things um, when they did this measurement. They learned, first of all, that nationalists, the ambassadors for Christian nationalism, are actually a pretty small group of Americans, less than 20% of Americans identify as ambassadors of Christian nationalism. They are in fact, as a group, dwarfed by the rejectors and the resistors. If we think of those as variations of one group, the rejectors and resistors together make up 50% of the American population. So half of the American population, if this survey is accurate, um, half of the American population would put themselves in either the rejector or the resistor um, uh, group as opponents of the ideology that Christian nationalism subscribes to. But interestingly, the accommodators, them all by themselves, are approximately a third of all Americans, which might explain why the appeals to, uh, of Christian nationalism get such traction in American culture, even though the group itself is less than 
they are appealing to values that another third of the American population in some softer way agree with. And so together, those two groups make up about half of the American population. So this is really um, uh, interesting, this uh, measure. And again, this is not the kind of work that I do, but I find it very useful to get a sense of how to imagine um, where Americans are on this issue of Christian nationalism. And depending on how you look at, look at this, on the one hand, um, it is significant that that ambassador group is very small and it raises questions about the cultural um, uh, cachet that nationalism has, especially uh, in its media portrayal. But on the other hand, if you look at their numbers, you realize that the rejectors and resistors are 50% of the population, the accommodators and ambassadors are 50%. And that seems about right, given what we intuitively feel in this polarized moment uh, in our uh, national life, that about half of us are leaning one way and about half of us are leaning the other. One of the other things that um, Whitehead and Perry want us to be clear about um, uh, in their uh, measurement of Christian nationalism is that to measure Christian nationalism is not the same thing as to measure evangelicalism. And this is something that they think the media gets uh, consistently wrong, um, that, the, that, the, that the news media tends to lump Christian nationalism and evangelicalism together um, in part because it seems an easy explanation for um, the prevalence of voting patterns among evangelicals. Whitehead and Perry are saying we need to be really very careful there. They're saying there are many Christian nationalists who don't identify as evangelicals. And there are many, many evangelicals who not only don't identify as Christian nationalists, but explicitly reject nationalism. So they, there's a certain correlation between evangelicals and nationalism. Most white nationalists, Christian nationalists um, are evangelical, but these are not the same group. Um, and uh, it's not helpful to, to lump them together the way some of our popular uh, conversation does. So ultimately Whitehead and Perry are giving us a picture uh, of this movement in American culture. And they're arguing that this, um, that this movement is not principally about religion. It's about political ideology dressed up in the garb of religion. Now, I wanna to argue tomorrow that still makes it a little bit about religion. Uh, and so those of us who are um, Christian, but may find nationalism problematic, still need to have a response uh, to it. Because even if it is at its heart not about Christianity, it is utilizing Christianity as a movement to justify its existence and to justify its vision of, um, uh, uh, of the United States and the, United, the destiny of the United States. One other observation about uh, what Whitehead and Perry do in this book, by giving us this spectrum from rejectors to ambassadors, one of the things they're trying to make clear is there is no hard and fast division between say Christian nationalists and the rest of us that it is in fact true that 50% of Americans subscribe to some degree or another to the ideas, the values, the expectations that Christian nationalists lift up in an extreme view. And again, that might ex help us to explain why it gets um, such uh, traction in American culture, but it also makes it a more difficult um, project um, uh, because there is such intersection between uh, the nationalist ideology and some values that some of us who would uh, disavow that ideology nonetheless uh, hold. Uh, a good example of that, um, that uh, from another um, social scientist uh, project is the whole debate about whether the US flag should be in um, uh, Christian sanctuaries. Um, uh, uh, that can be an indicator of Christian nationalism, but it doesn't have to be. There are lots and lots of uh, folks uh, of Christians who think it is entirely appropriate for a US flag to be in a sanctuary who would not identify as nationalism. And yet um, the shared convictions on that particular point make that line between nationalism and some of the rest of us uh, fuzzier um, uh, than uh, might be helpful. So this is the group that we're talking about. 
Um, it's a small group with an outsized um, influence uh, on um, both Christi American Christianity and American politics. And the movement um, is, um, uh, is based in and puts a lot of energy into justifying itself um, in a specific reading of history. So along with Christian nationalism comes this particular interpretation of American history that is itself dependent on some theological claims. And the story that Christian nationalists tell goes something like this. The United States was founded by Christians, by Orthodox Christians to be a Christian nation. So Christianity is not just the identity of the founders, but it was their intention. Nationalists argue that that was uh, the original intent of the founding um, and that that original intent um, is an identity that uh, the United States should continue to defend, preserve, and propagate. Uh, they tend to reach back uh, in this historical narrative to the Puritans and, the, and John Winthrop's invocation of a city on a hill and say, look, from our very beginnings, this was a nation established by Christians for Christians for Christian purposes. And they'll uh, point in the 18th century to examples of founders who they claim were Orthodox Christians and express support for the Christian foundations of American society. Um, they'll they'll uh, look at certain uh, public pronouncements from George Washington or Patrick Henry or John Jay, et cetera, and say, look, this is our historical evidence. Uh, that the founders were Orthodox uh, Christians. Furthermore, they uh, will often argue that the founding documents of the United States are sacred texts that were directly inspired by God, not uh, at the par of the Bible, but just under the Bible, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, etc., and that God's fingerprints are all over those sacred texts. And so the Christian nationalists say that our, if our founding was rooted in this original intent of making this a holy nation, a city on a hill for God, that the U.S. has a God-ordained purpose to be true to that original intent, to be true to that original mission, and to therefore be a beacon for Christian values in the world. This is who we are. And the move away from that identity is a theological and moral sin and a political crisis. Um, the abandonment of a cultural Christianity um, is seen as a threat to America's mission in the world. And that's why pluralism and secularism are seen as the grand domestic enemies uh, of our sacred mission. Because what are pluralists and secularists trying to do, they're trying to undermine the Christian character of our nation. So this is the, in, in brief, this is the historical narrative the Christian nationalists uh, tell as a way of justifying their vision of American politics uh, today. I have a, a several uh, problems uh, with this uh, reading of history, just as an historian, and I wanna share some of uh, those uh, with you uh, this evening. The first is um, that it seems uh, fairly obvious to me that the Christian nationalist um, understanding of the founding uh, misrepresents um, the pluralism among the founders themselves. The reality is that the founders of this nation subscribe to all kinds of um, religious interpretation and uh, some of them to no particular religion at all. Um, the, to come up with examples of non-Orthodox, uh, even non-Christian non founders is not that hard. Um, the, the easiest example is Thomas Jefferson, uh, who um, uh, utilized uh, the narrative, the moral narratives of Jesus in the Bible, but other than that had very little interest in organized Christianity as a religion uh, and his um, beliefs um, to describe them as orthodox uh, would, would require more than a little bit of creativity. Um, John Adams uh, understood himself to be a Christian, but he, uh, 
he would not pass muster uh, the muster of uh, today's evangelicals. He was, for all intent and purposes, a Unitarian. Uh, and both Jefferson and Adams were deeply suspicious of, um, of Christian clergy. Um, uh, so we're both uh, anti-institutional um, in, in that sense. Thomas Paine's another example. So there are examples in the, um, in the history of the founding of founders who did not in fact subscribe to anything that today's evangelicals would recognize as orthodox Christianity. The non-orthodox will often use, often use religious language uh, in their day because it was part of the cultural vernacular, but often they didn't mean the same thing as um, today's orthodox Christians might um, uh, by, by that usage. So my first problem with their telling of, uh, of the historical narrative is that there is more going on in the religiosity of those founders than they are wanting to um, acknowledge. Uh, and they co-opt some rather unorthodox um, uh, people for, as spokespersons for Orthodox Christianity in the 18th century. The second problem uh, I have with it is that it undercuts the Constitution's uh, uh, allergy to established religion that's built right into the American experiment. The First Amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And there's all kinds of room for different interpretations of those religion clauses to the First Amendment, but they would seem to, uh, to say on face value um, that the kind of fusion of Christian identity and political identity that the nationalists aspire to uh, is, is somewhat problematic. Um, now, um, a lot of Christian nationalists will tell you that um, the First Amendment was solely uh, meant to keep the state out of the church's business. It wasn't meant to keep religion out of politics, um, but to make that claim requires you to ignore some of the arguments in the construction and ratification of that First Amendment itself, where at least some of the people debating the First Amendment made quite clear that they were as worried about religion's intrusion on politics as the other way around. It requires you to ignore um, the arguments that James Madison himself made about religious liberty in Virginia, where he said, uh, the establishment of religion is a remarkably bad idea, and it's a bad idea for Christianity, but it's also a bad idea for the civil state. Uh, so once again, there's a smoothing over of the historical record on this, but it seems pretty clear to me that when you look at the text and when you look at um, the thinkers involved with the First Amendment, um, that they, what the nationalists are arguing for is what many of them had in mind uh, when they were crafting that prohibition. And then finally, my final problem uh, with their reading of the historical record is that they seem to completely ignore the fact that there were Christian communities who were among the most invested parties in avoiding the established religion that now these Christian nationalists want to say has always been part of the original intent. Uh, so the Baptists, uh, for instance, in the 18th century, um, they, uh, their conversations with Tom and Jeff Thomas Jefferson, that's where the wall of separation metaphor came from. Uh, uh, that's where Jefferson articulated it. Um, they were worried about the collapse of religion and state because in the 18th century, the Baptists were a religious minority. And they knew that if we fused religion and state identity, they were probably going to be on the losing side of that. Uh, so it's kind of ironic now that many uh, people who subscribe to Christian nationalists are in fact Baptist because they're on the reverse side of that contest uh, compared to where they were in the 18th century. And then our own Presbyterians uh, were also um, not big fans of the idea of established religion, at least eventually weren't. Uh, Presbyterians were used to a certain kind of state religion in Scotland uh, in the 18th century, and so they had some warmth to the idea of um, establishment, but ultimately uh, many Presbyterian, Presbyterian uh, leaders recognized the importance of separation um, and of guaranteeing um, a certain amount of religious pluralism in this new nation. Uh, and eventually Presbyterians played a key role in the defeat of religious uh, establishment in places like Virginia, uh, where 
um, where James Madison marshaled the Presbyterians as allies uh, to def uh, defeat um, uh, a bill establishing Christian religion and taxes to support Christian religion. So, um, so this last problem with their narrative is that uh, they seem unaware that uh, Christians themselves in the 18th century thought that the idea of fusing um, Christian identity and political identity was a remarkably bad idea. So uh, Christian nationalists oversimplify um, uh, history in my, uh, in my view, uh, in their claims that a Christian America has always been the original intent of this nation. But that doesn't mean that they get everything wrong. And it's probably important for us to acknowledge that um, because there were uh, in the 18th century, political thinkers and Christian leaders who did think um, that uh, some of what uh, today's nationalists uh, are proposing might be a good idea. So not everyone back there agreed if, uh, that church and state should be stridently separated. Nationalists are right to claim that uh, there are a few founders back then who would um, uh, hold views uh, um, uh, close to theirs. John Jay is probably the best example of that. Many more of the founders assumed that some religiosity in the culture, at least, might be necessary to maintain order and to encourage virtue among citizens. And so uh, there were, it was a common enough belief in the 18th century that religion can, um, uh, can, be, uh, can help the common good um, by encouraging people uh, to live uh, with good character with one another. Uh, George Washington seemed to subscribe uh, to that assumption, uh, John Adams to some degree, and this rascal who's on your, um, on your slide, John Witherspoon, uh, in whose work I'm, um, I'm, I'm starting to dive uh, deep uh, in the last couple of months. Many more people assumed uh, in the 18th century that religious people should have the right to participate in public life without leaving their religion at the door. Uh, or even their religious offices. So there was a move by some thinkers, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, to say clergy people should have no right to hold political office. Um, so that if Kathy wanted to be a senator or a representative, she would have to set aside her ordination to do that. Um, but they were a distinct minority. Uh, most people in the 18th century thought you could do both of these things at the same time and that it would be an incursion on the rights of clergymen and it was clergymen back then, um, uh, to not be able to hold public office. And again, John uh, Witherspoon was, in fact, a clergyman um, uh, and, uh, and also a, um, a, a political uh, uh, activist. Um, he was a signer of the Declaration of, of Independence. So the strident separation of church and state um, uh, that is represented by uh, Thomas Jefferson's you know, wall of separation um, the anti-clericalism of Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, these are not typical views in the 18th century, despite the way that today's separationists sometimes want to argue that separation of church and state was always actually the DNA uh, of the American experiment. So I want to mention that to say that the Christian nationalists are not entirely wrong in arguing that some people back there thought that a close relationship between religion and public life was a good thing. Um, and that today's strict separationist distorts the historical record as much as the ardent Christian nationalist does. The reality is that the, in the 18th century, the founders had nuanced, various, complicated, sometimes contradictory understandings and assumptions about the relationship between Christian religion and political life. And that that soft and ambiguous relationship between religion and politics continued and had an effect on subsequent American history. And that that is in America's political DNA. Um, that we have, a, that religion and politics have a very messy and complicated relationship. I think that is in part good news because I think that historical reality invites us to imagine the relationship between our faith 
and our citizenship in ways that are similarly nuanced, complica uh, complicated. Um, and I'm gonna try to do a little bit of that uh, tomorrow morning. But there is consensus at, this, at the time of the founding on the separation of the institutions of church and state, no established religion, no litmus test for office, no explicit incorporation of religious convictions into law. So the historical record seems to go away from um, uh, the Christian nationalist extreme theocratic aspirations, even if they are right that in general, uh, the culture at that time supported some intersection between religious life and political life. Now, one more thing that we should uh, talk about uh, regarding the historical uh, narrative. Um, it would actually be, um, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about how race factors uh, into all of this. Um, historically, the appeals to a Christian founding are of a particular kind of Christian origin, namely white Anglo-Saxon Christianity, Protestant Christianity. The face of Christianity, uh, of political Christianity, Christianity in power in the 18th century, that face was not black, it was white. Uh, and it reflected a Christianity that was, among other things, able to reconcile a push for independence and a practice of enslavement. Um, that this Christianity was able to theologically endorse the effort to emancipate a country from its political overseers in England at the very same time that some of those in power uh, were not poking significantly, sometimes aggressively defending, sometimes themselves practicing the enslavement of black people. So um, the point of this is that if we wanna reach back as the Christian nationalists invite us to do to that revolutionary Christianity for a sense of the original intent, we need to take all of it. And that means uh, we have to acknowledge that what we're reaching back uh, for is a Christianity that was white, that was Protestant, and that was racist uh, to a, a substantial degree. And this, um, this particular uh, um, a flavor of Christianity continues to be dominant in American culture um, uh, uh, through our history to today. This is the same um, flavor of Christianity that uh, gives us the anti-Catholic uh, bigotry of the 19th century that is leveled against waves and waves of, of immigrants coming into this country um, that perpetuates um, racist uh, oppression of black Americans even after uh, slavery that has an effect on foreign policy, where, uh, where we colonize, where we conquer, and how we do it. Uh, so so this, this is part of the legacy. Uh, of uh, white Protestant Christianity that um, Christian nationalists are appealing to, and we need to acknowledge that explicitly. Um, in their defense, some Christian nationalists actually do acknowledge and embrace uh, that as part of their larger uh, project. But many more Christian nationalists, I think, underplay um, uh, the racial implications uh, of, of reaching back and demanding that that original intent um, of the 18th century govern how we think about American society today. In our day, Christian nationalism is not 100% white. There are black Christian nationalists, although I have to admit that that's a phenomenon I have a very hard time getting my mind around, um, but there are black Christian nationalists. But overall, the picture of the past, present, and future of Christian America that Christian nationalism puts forward and defends is predominantly white. Um, in fact, Whitehead and Perry argued that uh, nationalism is more about race um, than it is about religion. I'm not sure how you measure that, but I think it's safer to say that they're, they're uh, inextricably intertwined. Um, and in an, another really, I think, fine book, and the one that's on your uh, screen now, Robert Jones, who's another pollster and, and um, social scientist of religion in the United States, Robert Jones in uh, White Too Long suggests that Christian complicity in racial segregation and supremacy 
is another feature of Christian nationalism that unfortunately taps into broader trends within American Christianity, even beyond those who claim to be Christian nationalists. Um, so Jones is arguing that this is another way in which that less than 20% um, actually is making appeal to traditions um, that are longstanding in the wider practice of Christianity, that, that for much of its history, white Protestantism, that Protestantism in this country has been a segregated experience. Uh, and we know that Martin Luther King um, uh, often gave voice uh, to that as well. He said that um, Sunday morning is the most segregated hour in America. Um, Jones is saying this once again, whether we acknowledge it or not, this is another one of those places in which nationalism is actually um, uh, resonating with um, values, practices, traditions, habits um, that a wider variety of Christians actually um, call home. So we need to understand that there are racial consequences to this historical and theological debate around nationalism and that there should probably always be a parenthetical white in front of Christian nationalism when we use that term. So um, this, what have we done uh, so far? Um, what we've done, I think, is put into play the question of the relationship between Christian identity and political identity. And what I wanted to do uh, this evening is look in particular at one specific answer to that, namely Christian nationalism. And I have argued that Christian nationalism is, um, is about ultimately power. It's about power baptized in Christian theology and endorsed by a particular reading of the American um, historical narrative. And that Christian na nationalism is distinct as a movement because of its militant defense of a collapse of Christian identity and political um, life in this country and by its uh, overt hostility to pluralism, secularism, and anything else it considers to be a threat to the um, Christian soul uh, of the United States. In uh, arguing that way, I've argued that they get both history and theology wrong. Uh, and I've been at pains to argue tonight the ways in which I think they get the history wrong. Tomorrow, we'll think a little bit more about how they might also, um, there might be better ways to understand Christian theology on this question of dual identities as well. And yet Christian nationalism is a pernicious presence because it uses Christian values to argue for its exclusive understanding of the relationship between faith and national identity. And it appeals to ideas in both theology and in the influence of religious values on public life that many non-nationalist Americans find appealing to one degree or another. For the strict separationists are also not right in more or less taking the question off the table. When the strict separationists say that the answer to the question, how should faith relate to national identity is they shouldn't, they get history wrong too. There is considerable historical precedent for assuming that our faith identity is relevant to our understanding of our obligations as Christian citizens. So how might we go, uh, they go together in a way that's more constructive than what nationalism or frankly, strict separationism both offer? Tomorrow, I wanna think theologically about patriotism about the obligations of citizenship, about what it means to be an American Christian. And I wanna do that within the Reformed tradition, in our uh, Presbyterian tradition. Um, we'll do so with the aid of history, including some historical texts from our own Book of Confessions. And we will utilize uh, a, an historical figure that I think is un underappreciated, both in American history and in the history of the Reformed tradition, and that is a guy named Roger Williams, um, uh, the founder of Rhode Island. I'm going to want to tomorrow claim him as a reformed theologian and argue that he might uh, 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 just have the secret to understanding how we can be both uh, Christian and American 
and be and uh, exercise both of those identities uh, with uh, faithfulness and integrity. Uh, and then we'll think constructively about what that might mean uh, in our time and place uh, today. So that's where I think we're going uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, if you come back, uh, I promise I will. Um, but uh, I'm now uh, happy to take some questions or have conversation. How do you define, what is your definition of militant? Hmm. Um, I would define uh, militant Barbara as, um, as willing to use coercion, uh, coercive measures in order to bring about their aim. Um, and that coercion might be violence, but it doesn't need to be violence. It can also be um, that uh, as many nationalists are arguing that they'd like to use the coercive power of the state and the coercive power of law um, to force this particular understanding of American identity um, into our public culture. So that's what I mean um, uh, by militant is that they're willing to embrace uh, coercive measures uh, to win the day. Could you also tell us the titles of those books that appeared in the painting? There were two of them. Uh, the ones in the painting? Yeah. Or on, uh, the, on the slides. Right here or on the? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see any books in that slide. I think what Jesus is holding, I think. On the, on the steps. Oh yes, I don't know what those pages are. So I just stumbled on this uh, on this uh, picture um, this summer, and I don't know much about the painter, um, though I know that the the painter, the artist, this is what he does: is he paints these kinds of uh, what I'm calling nationalistic historical portraits. But I studied this for a good bit this summer, and I can't quite figure out what that those pages are. My best guess is kneeling right next to them is a is clearly a preacher, a pastor, because he's in a, I think it's clear, he's either a judge or a pastor, but I think he's a pastor. And so it may be the pages of a sermon. I don't, uh, I don't know, but I can't see close enough to see if it's anything more specific than that. Well, Jesus there are is two holding, people holding books, one on the people. right and one on the left. I'm pretty sure the one on the left is holding a Bible. The one on the right is holding very purposely. I see that you're right, but I can't make out the title. I don't know what that is. And then I think Jesus is holding the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My first thought for the guy on the, on the steps was a judge and that the law was not sufficient. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think he looks more like a judge too. Okay. The robe does. Yeah. That's a that's really interesting. Um, James, I, I wanted to ask you a question about, or I guess maybe it's just an observation, but um, you know, this morning you said that, and I think it's true that our country is more divided than it has been in 150 years. And there are lots of things you can point to, but I think one of the things that bothers me the most is this implication that if you don't subscribe to certain things or if you vote a certain way or for certain people that you're not a patriot and that you don't love this country. And that bothers me so much. And I'm, I've, I love this country. And my, my dad was a Purple Heart recipient in World War II. I mean, I have a, I get cold chills every time I hear the national anthem. I mean, I, I do love this country, but I point to like the whole issue of the athletes when they take a knee, when the national anthem is being played. And I've seen people like on Facebook and on social media to have a picture of that. And then next to it, they show the flag draped coffins of American soldiers to make you feel guilty. You know, I think it's to, it's again, that coercion to make you feel like there's something wrong with you. I mean, it bothers me when people take a knee, but I think they have a right to do that in this country. 
But to then imply that I don't care about soldiers who have lost their lives is just it, it it's just wrong. It's just infuriating to me. So I guess that's more of an observation than a question, but no, I would I I would agree with you. And I think that um one of the things that's really aggravated um, the sense of division in this country is the binary way in which we think of uh, uh, of virtually anything. Um, and this this has been uh, in the making, to my mind, this has been in the making for at least 10, 20, uh, 30 years. Um, uh, th this uh, that it, it's it, it originates in a new political in the 1990s, a new political strategy that consensus is dangerous, that compromise is dangerous, that politics needs to be undertaken in a kind of winner take all uh, scorched earth campaign. Um, it originates with one uh, political party, very quickly, both of them get good at it. Um, and the result is that we think in either or uh, terms uh, about virtually anything in the public uh, arena. And I think you've given a great example of that, where there is, we squeeze out the very complicated middle ground in which many of us would uh, relate, would identify, right? That uh, who believe that there is some such thing as gray and that the gray is good, that I can be both patriotic um, and uh, supportive of people's right to protest or that I can um, uh, disagree with a protest and not be racist. Um, uh, so that middle ground um, and, and the ability to navigate complex positions on issues that resist that either or, that's uh, kind of collectively a, a, a a, a, a skill set that we no longer have, nor even regard as good. Um, and it's made us a, a lot more polarized in the last, especially in the last, I think, 10 or 15 years, makes it very difficult to figure out what the antidote for that is. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's what I was hoping you were gonna give us an answer to, James. <laughs> um, it's difficult. I didn't say it was impossible, Kathy. Um, <laughs> I, and and I, I, I do want to say uh, something about that uh, uh, tomorrow morning. Um, and spoiler alert, you know, you can um, shut Zoom off if you don't want to know what's going on uh, tomorrow morning. But, um, but I do think that those of us who claim Christian identity and, uh, and uh, are part of the community of the church, that we might be one possible antidote for that. But it requires us to get our own houses in order first. James? Yeah. Wait. When you were explaining the history and you know how we might think it is one way and it really isn't all actually correct, I was thinking back to a, a scene in 12 Years a Slave, the movie, that made a huge impression on me of um, a slave owner on a Sunday gathers all the slaves together and preaches the sermon and reads directly from the Bible. Um, what justifies his treatment of them. Um, and I, I'm, it makes me remember when you're doing the history of how a little information is a dangerous thing and not knowing that coins have two sides and things like that. Yeah. It's also okay. a really great, great example, uh, Shirley, of the... Um, of the way that race and Christian nationalism are intertwined, right? Um, in the 19th century, a lot of the defense of American slavery was done by biblical proof texting. As to say, you know, uh, by um, theologians, including theologians who sat in chairs in the seminary that Kathy and I went to. Um, mm -hmm. Theologians going to the biblical text and saying, Look, there's nothing in here that um, that outlaws uh, uh, slavery, and in fact, there's an implicit endorsement of slavery, because Paul says, "Masters treat your slaves kindly." He doesn't say, "Stop having slaves." Um, and so that I think is just one particularly um, jarring for many of us example of the way 
that through history, um, Christian nationalism has used um, Christianity, has used um, the Bible um, to um, baptize what is really uh, a, a play of power, in this case, racial uh, uh, power. And in fact, that was the more popular argument in much of the early 19th century because um, the abolitionists weren't nearly as good, like today's liberals, they weren't um, nearly as good at making biblical arguments as, as, um, as the apologists for, uh, for slavery were. We can maybe take an, one more question or so. We we got a late start, so I don't want to cut us off. Um, but if there's somebody maybe who hasn't asked a question, and if there's nobody else, Barbara, that has a question, I'll come back to you. I see you. But I just want to make sure there's somebody else who hasn't had a chance to I got ask. my magnifying glass to see what this book says. Oh, oh that's awesome. That's and awesome. The one on the left says, the first or last thousand year something <laughs> hmm. i can't see the right one and i just realized on the left i was looking at the wrong book there is a bible on the left but i didn't even see the book that you're talking about which is on the left margin left. uh and i've been staring at this picture off and on for a couple of months now and i never saw that book um that's really interesting Barbara, what's your magnifying? Your magnifying glass, uh, glass doesn't tell you what the book on the right hand side is. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not that good. Okay. Is there anybody else that has another question that you want to make sure you get in before we conclude tonight? This is Betty, and I just want to know the name of the painting. The, the name of the painter? Painting or the painter. Well, 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 darn, Betty, I didn't write that down. I forget <laughs> it. Um, but I will, you've now given me homework. Um, well, I'm a former art teacher, so I need those details. <laughs> yes, okay. And you shall have them tomorrow morning. I'm ready. Thank that you. Down. All right. It's somewhere it's in my notes, but I didn't put it, I, I didn't, uh, it didn't make the final cut. No, we need to study that painting. I just noticed the pregnant lady down on the right hand corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you can just keep looking and looking and looking, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's fascinating. It's a fascinating piece. And I, I hate to do this, but I think I'm going to stop sharing the painting so that we can all see each other <laughs> before oh, we go. <laughs> thanks, Kathy. I didn't even think about doing that. I well, should have okay. done that. No, well, we've, been, we've been so fascinated by the painting. There wasn't any yeah. reason to stop sharing <laughs> until this particular moment. But um so I, I hope you'll join me in saying thank you uh, to Dr. Davis for another time of stimulating our brains and making us think. And I keep writing down other books that now I need to read <laughs> the list, not just the, big, the books in the painting, but some of the other books that he suggested. So thank you so much for a full day with us. We are really, really grateful for all of that time. Just want to make sure everybody knows um, one of the times when I put my close my video was Thomas was just here to say that he'll he will do his best to get the recording of this and um, the recording from this morning.